Hey guys, and welcome to the first ever Pocket Now podcast. We're calling this the Pocket Cast. We've never done a podcast before, even though we've gotten a lot of requests for them over the years. Uh, we wanted to do a podcast in a little bit of a different way than what you see out there. So the format this will take is sort of a raw, unedited conversation between two smartphone geeks. And it will vary from week to week, uh, probably in the form of one Pocket Now editor to another Pocket Now editor. This week, we're going to start out with Evan Blass. He's the managing editor here at uh, Pocket Now. And Evan, say hi. Hey, thanks for having me, Brandon. Awesome. And so, yeah, so we're just going to cover about seven or eight pieces of content that we posted within the last seven days, things that we thought were particularly interesting, and we're just going to talk about it. And so you might hear mess ups and bloopers and whatever, and we're going to leave it all in there uh, for the sake of keeping this as raw as possible. Uh, and this will be, this will continue on only if you guys want it to, to continue on. So please leave comments. Please let us know if you like this. If you like it, we'll keep doing it. If you hate it, We'll stick to, to video because we do a lot of video. Um, so we are going to uh, start it off now, the first ever Pocket Cast. So what are we starting with, Evan? Well, I wanted to know, uh, I heard that you, uh, you got the, the Dell venue this week, and I just wanted to know what you thought of it so far. And uh, maybe for the, the listeners who don't know, if you could, if you could tell them a little bit about it. It's, uh, sort of an Android-powered um, Venue Pro, right? But it doesn't have a keyboard, obviously. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We saw this device a long time ago. I think Engadget leaked it. Uh, they had, or I think it was actually the Venue Pro that got leaked as the Lightning. And did we ever actually see the Venue as a leak, or was it just the, the Lightning? No, we saw the Venue as the Thunder. Ah, yeah, so we saw we we saw it as the thunder, and everyone was like, "Whoa, look look what Dell's doing! They're coming forward with some awesome Android phones. These things are never going to come out." And then they came out. Um, and There's actually, a, um, a third phone that um, that supposedly they have in the um, in the pipeline called the Flash. And um, if that's a code name for it, I'm betting that the the uh, retail name is going to be Advist, A-D-V-I-S-T. So you heard it here first, folks. Because um, <laughs> right now that's the only smartphone trademark that Dell has that's not being used. Huh, interesting. And so the Flash looks like the venue, but it's uh, got a front-facing camera, it is white, and it has a different interface. Right, exactly. Hmm, interesting. But specs, at least at the time, uh, you know, that... They were leaked uh, about nine months ago, and, and at this point, they seem a little bit uh, antiquated. I'm not sure. I think they would have to bump them up a little bit. They want this to be competitive, at least, or, or maybe they're not looking at it to be a, a high-end handset at this point. Except, you know, I would I would agree with you with an 800 megahertz processor, but um, hmm, it, it has a front-facing camera, which kind of implies high-end. So maybe this, you know, this is just not going to ever ever come around. Odd, yeah, odd, oddly, the uh, the buttons are in a different arrangement. I'm looking at the flash. So anyway, yeah, the Venue, uh, really cool phone because the Dell Venue Pro, I think, had the highest build quality of any phone I've ever used. And we rated it really high in our review. Because of that, it was also super fast. It made Windows Phone 7 look awesome. Uh, and then the Venue is basically the same thing. It's a little bit thinner. It has no slide-out keyboard, and it's running Android 2.2 with the Dell Stage UI that you kind of get off of the Dell Streak. Um, and it's it's a commanding device, like the Venue Pro. I mean, it's got this curved glass display. It's beautiful, 4.1-inch AMOLED display. It's the biggest AMOLED that they make. Uh, you know, Samsung's in there with their 4.0-inch um, Super AMOLED. So it's a striking phone. But anyone I give this to to hold in the hand say, wow, this feels great, but it's heavy. So that's... um. I think that's that's my biggest complaint. But it, it's it's fast in in quadrant. It doesn't really measure up for some reason. Uh, but in day to day operation, it feels fast. But uh, overall, I'm pretty impressed with it. I I'm looking at this device, which is on T-Mobile, the venue, and I'm also looking at a device like the Nexus S. And I gotta say, the Nexus S just looks a whole lot better. It's a lot faster. Uh, the fit and finish just seems to be a little bit better on the uh, on the Nexus S. So it's kind of a hard decision. Really? What's do you do you know offhand what the processor is in the venue? Yeah, it's a uh, one gigahertz Snapdragon. Okay, versus what the an eight hundred megahertz um, 
Hummingbird and uh, the Samsung. I think the, um, the the Nexus S has the one gigahertz Hummingbird, just like the uh, the other Galaxy S devices. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, they both have 512 megabytes of RAM. What was really interesting was that I was getting HSPA on the venue, and I ran like a million benchmarks over the last few days, and it's not HSPA speeds. And then I was trying to determine if there's a difference between HSPA and HSPA+, Plus, which there probably is, but it's really weird because the Nexus S is getting HSDPA on T-Mobile, then you turn on the, the venue, it's getting HSPA, but they're both getting the same data speed, so... That doesn't really matter. Do you know if, the, if HSPA Plus is um, live in your network, in your area, I mean? I don't, but I would have to assume that it is because I live right outside of Philly and we tend to get, you know, the, the sort of bumped up wireless speeds are kind of first. And I was just driving through Philly today. I did a benchmark and I wasn't getting HSPA Plus. So um, I just, I, I guess it just doesn't support the, the plus, which is technically called enhanced HSPA. So that, that bit of excitement kind of went away when, uh, when I discovered that it wasn't that fast. And we just learned um, at CES that T-Mobile is actually going to be pushing their network to um, 42 megabits per second this year, theoretical speeds. Yeah, that's, that's going to be great. And then they want to go all the way to 672 uh, megabits per second down. Which yeah, they're they're really gonna milk every last every drop bit of uh, every bit of bandwidth out of this thing. I guess I guess the the uh, the downside is the opportunity cost of investing in HSPA plus. You know they're not gonna be able to spend those resources deploying their LTE network. They'll have it ready by what like 2013. Right, but I think it's it's probably a lot more expensive to, to roll out LTE, which is a, a completely new technology as opposed to just upgrading their existing, you know, backbone, which is, you know, they already have the, the HSDPA in place. I think it's just a matter of, you know, making enhancements to it as opposed to putting completely new hardware out there. Right. But, but I guess it, it'll be a shame if, you know, they, they finally do invest in their LTE. They bring it out in 2013. And it's doing speeds that Verizon is achieving today, while in 2013, Verizon will be, you know, doing speeds far, far greater than where they are today. Yeah, LTE Advanced is the, uh, the one that follows LTE. Yeah, so it, I, I always wondered, is, is that just a matter of flipping a switch on Verizon's end, or do they, they have to climb up every tower and put a new, like, you know, cartridge in it or something to turn on the Advanced? I honestly don't know. It would be nice to get someone here on the pocket cast that can maybe tell us about that. Um, I think it's it's more than turning a switch. Um, I think it, it has a lot to do with, with software and, and optimizing the way that the um, you know that the packets are um, passed around. But but beyond that, it's it's way too technical. We should actually get Gabe on here. I bet he understands it. Yeah, Gabe is our new highly technical writer on Pocket now, and perhaps he could shed some light on this. So. That's definitely something to consider because I think a lot of people are kind of mystified by all of these wireless standards that come and go over the years. Um, so, so let's get into uh, some of the content we posted this week. We're going to start off with uh, NVIDIA talking about their Tegra 2 3D chip and then their Tegra 3 quad-core chip um, coming out later in 2011. This stuff's going to be launched at Mobile World Congress. Quad cores in a smartphone. Why is the world ready for quad cores in a smartphone? First of all, um, sure. I mean, you know, as long as uh, as, as developers are are able to uh, write software to take advantage of it, um, I don't see why not. And, and and let me also say, you know, they have to keep the uh, the power consumption down. You know, you can't have four cores pulling as or or using as much power as a dual core. Or you know the battery is going to drain you know almost twice as fast. Yeah, they've got to be building in some some really fantastic power saving technology because, I mean, uh, we're we're going to see some I think crappy battery life come dual core time with the upcoming devices and add double that. Uh, I just think it's going to be kind of uh, ridiculous in terms of battery drain, especially when I'm sure it has the ability to turn off three cores and only use one, but. If you're doing a lot of intense gaming, I can't imagine your battery lasting very long. 
Yeah, it's sort of funny. I remember, you know, back in the day before we had smartphones, batteries, they used to last a couple of days. And, and now we sort of just accepted the fact that, you know, your battery is going to last a day, if that, sometimes. You, speaking of which, do you remember the days when you had a Windows mobile phone and if you let the battery discharge, you'd lose all of your data? No, I don't. I was, I was on <laughs> Palm, I think, when, when you were doing that. Lucky you. Yeah, it was, uh, that was before Windows Mobile 5.0. It was kind of ridiculous. But yeah, back in the day, PDAs would last for days on end because they weren't constantly sending and receiving wireless data and, you know, using GPS. So uh, that, that was pretty reasonable. What, what kind of, kinds of applications do you think can take advantage of quad-core configurations? Um, just about anything that's processor intensive, um, you know, rendering web pages, watching high uh, resolution or high definition video, gaming, like you said, um, doing um, like virtual desktops, um, VNC, you know, if you want to control your computer and, and um, you know, look at your, your desktop in real time on the phone, right. stuff like that, you know, you, you can never have too much power for that. I suppose, I, you know, I, it's it's crazy because I pick up the Nexus S, which, as far as I know, is the fastest uh, Android phone out there right now, and everything's instant. You know, bringing up a web page, of course, takes some time if it's graphic heavy, but going into email and SMS and t using the phone, playing some games, it is so fast. I just can't imagine. I know this is going to sound weird in a year from now, but I can't imagine it being any faster. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, don't don't make the same mistake I did, Brandon. <laughs> What do you mean? When I was like, you know, the editorial I wrote, oh. I said, you know, I, can, can smartphones really get that much better than they are now? And, you know, it, it was it, it was sort of half playing devil's advocate and, and half true. You know, I mean, if smartphones never got any better than they are right now, like, we'd still be totally happy with them. If the iPhone, you know, would never got one iota better. You know, they just kept coming out with, with apps of, of the same caliber. Like, it would be fine. You know, I mean, maybe other people don't feel that way, but, but uh, that's certainly my feeling at this point. Well, I, I guess you, you mean to say that for what you use it for, you would be satisfied if you didn't get more advanced capabilities uh, on top of yeah, what you have today. There's, there's almost nothing I could think of, and, and that never used to be the case. I, you know, the phone could be faster, it could have a higher resolution screen, mm -hmm. the camera could be better. and. And now, you know, they're so close. I mean, yeah, the, the camera could still be a little bit better. You know, the flash could be better. But, with the, you know, I'm not sure that, that we're ever going to see um, really like, great cameras on, on the phones just because, you know, the, the lenses are so small. You know, you have to, it's a balance there where you have to decide whether you want, um, you know, whether you want um, portability or you want good optics. I gotta say though that the camera on the iPhone 4 and a phone or two more like the um, like the Galaxy S, well, well the Nexus S in particular, is better than the Sony point and shoot camera that I paid 300 bucks for like two years ago. Sure. I mean, it, it, they've. I, I agree that just because of the 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 nature of the lens needing to be large to let in a lot of light, you can never have a, a a cell phone camera be as good as a DSLR. But they they are. Darn good. I mean, some I of these. I can't zoom either, which is, is really unfortunate. <laughs> well, tell that to. Uh, I think there. I think a couple of weeks ago we posted about a, an Android phone that had an optical zoom. It was really ugly, but uh, it 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 was there. <laughs> is that from Panasonic? Could have been. Is that, is that right? Or Altec, perhaps. It was. It was a no-name company, and it looked like crap. Um, this, is a, this is a kid show, Brandon. There's going to be children listening to this. We better watch our language. I hope not. This is this is rated PG-13. Um, just so so to kind of conclude about the the quad core thing, um, I think thinking about phones in today's context and what we do with phones today, it's sort of impossible to say. Um, it's impossible to say that yeah we need quad cores, but if you sort of think for a minute and kind of extend out what phones will be used for in the future perhaps desktop class applications made into a touch-friendly interface, then it sort of starts to make a little bit more sense. And 
I don't think by the end of 2011, when Tegra 3 is going to be around, we're going to have this answer. And a lot of people are going to think it's a little bit ridiculous that we've quad-core uh, CPUs and phones, but, you know, that's, just, that's the way things are going, and uh, it, maybe it'll all make sense a year or two from now. Yeah, I think everything will make sense in a year from now, Bernard. <laughs> I said that last year, and it was, I was wrong. Anyway, so let's move uh, on. Let's see here. So on January 25th, Google Voice opened number porting to everyone which was a feature that a lot of people were waiting for, like me. Yeah, um, why don't you tell us about your experience with that? Yeah, so I've always had this, I, okay, call it a fantasy if you want, a fantasy of being, being able to use any phone that I want. And, you know, Number PG-13. Okay, all right. <laughs> I, so, you know, I review a fair amount of phones for Pocket Now, and if I'm reviewing a phone on another carrier, I've got to forward my number. And so with the idea of porting my number to Google Voice, I could set up future phones on any carrier so that I can receive calls and send calls from my native number and everything would be great. So, you know, I took the plunge on January 25th. I ported my number to Google Voice. I probably incurred a $200 ETF on AT&T. Um, I was about probably 40% of the way through the contract, but I figure um, I'm going to be saving money because I was paying probably $111 or $110 for AT&T unlimited data, 1,500 minutes, 1,500 texts. And now I am using a T-Mobile prepaid card that's giving me unlimited voice and data plus two gigabytes of data, or no, unlimited voice and text and uh, two gigabytes of data for 70 bucks. So, you know, in about four months, I'll break even from this uh, early termination fee. And so far, I've been happy. You know, there's a few caveats to Google Voice, but, you know, I've got freedom to, to use any phone as, le as long as it has a Google Voice application. And uh, I feel like a new man. So, um, now, now you're making calls, though, um, over the standard cellular network, right? You're, you're not making um, voice over IP calls, correct? Right, and that's, I think, a misconception of Google Voice. What it does is, it's a little complicated, you use your phone, and I'm talking about Android. Uh, iPhone is a little bit different. You use your phone as if you were just calling anybody. You'll get a little pop-up that says, you you know, it says like now routing your call with Google Voice, and Google Voice is going to call another number, which will use Voice over IP and somehow connect that with your actual Google Voice number. I'm not sure the technicalities of it. So it is working over your minutes. So it will go against your minutes using Google Voice. Gotcha. But now, now Google also has a product like Skype, right, where, where it's voice over IP the whole way. Yeah, so you can connect your, you can make Google Voice calls over your Google Voice number through uh, Gchat. And that is totally voice over IP. Okay, but now um, you can't generally do that, um, at least through the carriers, over... Um, over your data plane. You could probably do it over Wi-Fi, I would imagine. Or maybe not at all. Can, can you do Gchat at all from the phone? Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know about that. We should, we should look up the answer and then put um, a little annotation on the video. We will. We will do that. But that would be a good question, whether you can use uh, Google Chat on your phone to place a call through Google Voice over Voice over IP over your data connection, I'm gonna I'm gonna say probably not, but we'll look into that. So my question to you, Evan, is why don't you put your number on Google Voice? Well, number one, I don't want to pay the, the termination fee, and number two, I like having my Google Voice number as a virtual number as opposed to an actual number. Meaning, I like using I like giving that number to people, and then you know being able to to sort of have it like a firewall, you know, to be able to um, manage things at, at at that level. The same thing as having a virtual email address. Hmm. So so there's a number of reasons for me. So, but I mean, couldn't you use your primary number as a like a sort of firewall as you as you describe it? I, why does it have to be a sort of uh, random number that Google Voice assigns you? 
I'm not sure I understand the question. So you want to have, uh, you have a Google Voice account, right? Right. And you're using a, a random number that they assign to you. More or less, I, I pick the area code. You pick the area code. So and and you like that because you can give that to you know new people that you meet, and you're not actually giving them your real phone number, so you can rest assured that you could block their call if you don't like them or if they're annoying or something. Right, and then you know you can also decide which phones that ring to. I mean, right now I don't actually have a landline, but you know if I ever want one again, yeah. it would be nice to to be able to control that, you know, from, from, from that uh, one panel, but while also being able to have the, the separate numbers to give to people, you know, people like my parents who, who don't necessarily understand um, that, that long distance is, is free now. So they like <laughs> have, you know, they like to have a number for me that, that's in a local area code for them. I see. I, I, I think that you would be able to achieve those so, same benefits by porting your number to Google Voice. Um, but you would, I don't know. You, you and let me say something else is, is how, how, are you, um, how are you getting data right now on your phone? You're, you're just doing a, a, I mean, you still have to, uh, you still have to pay, um, pay a cell phone company for service, right? Yeah, yeah. So it, it doesn't seem to me that, that, I mean, you're benefiting monetarily all that much, are you? Uh, well, well, as I mentioned, I'm saving 40 or $50 a month. Uh, so I guess for most people, they probably are on a plan that is already optimized. Um, but I was on this AT&T plan that was just too expensive, and I wasn't using you know half the features or using half the messages. Uh, so for to be fair, I'm sorry, but to be fair, you could have you just moved over to T-Mobile anyway and gotten a new plan without doing the number for it and saved money. Yeah, but another consideration is that, you know, I'm on this T-Mobile prepaid plan. I can cancel it at any time. I'm really staring at that, that HTC Thunderbolt on, on Verizon's 4G network. I may want to switch to that network full time. And if I do that, there's not going to be more number porting that I have to go to. You know, it'll, it'll immediately, uh, using Google Voice, I can immediately basically use my phone number with Verizon's LTE phone. But you will have, you will have to get a phone number through Verizon, right? Yeah, I mean, when you sign up for a new contract, you'll have a phone number, and basically you're just forwarding, uh, you set Google Voice to forward to that new number. And, ha and also, how much data are you getting now through uh, T-Mobile? Uh, yes, two gigabytes, but, uh, you know, I was on the unlimited AT&T plan before, but I was... Well, you can never get that back, you should, you should have given that up. I know, and that was the hardest part, but, but listen to this, I, I looked over my data usage in the last two years, and, you know, I'm a pretty heavy smartphone user. I tether all the time. I've never gone over 900 megabytes of data. Have you, uh, have you taken a look at your, your usage? Yeah, all it takes is one time where you're on vacation and, and you want to Slingbox like Billy's game. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, Slingbox will, will, will do it, that's for sure. Oh, I'm sorry. If there's, if there's any AT&T um, people listening to this, you, you never heard that. <laughs> I don't, I don't think that you're, you're technically allowed to do that um, with your phone or through your phone. You're not supposed to, but I mean, you're paying, you're paying them for data. You should be able to use the data for whatever you want, right? Yeah, that's what I say. Anyhow, so let's move on. I'm going to write a, a kind of lengthy editorial on Google not Voice porting, why people would, people would want to put their number over there, um, sort of the compromises I've had to face because I think a lot of people could benefit from doing this. It's not for everyone, but definitely something to uh, to consider. Let's... Yeah, I might write a counterpoint to your editorial saying that, that it's not really that great. Is that a challenge? I wouldn't say it's a challenge. I'm just you know, saying that I think our readers should get, should get both uh, points of view. And um, you know, we shouldn't necessarily maybe tell them to go run out and do something that that the average person <laughs> get all that many benefits from, especially if they're going to have to pay easier. All right, so my title will be Why You Should Port Your Number to Google Voice. Yours will be Why You Shouldn't Port Your Number to Google Voice, and we will see who wins. Right, but I want to read yours first because I want to do it more like a, a counterpoint to your article. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. I'm always up for a challenge. All right, so let's move on. We Another thing we posted on January 25th, uh, talking about the LG Optimus 3D potentially the first 3D smartphone. And, uh, you know, certainly 3D has had difficulty getting traction in the TV space. 
and now they're going to bring it to a smartphone, although potentially without needing glasses. Mm, I might argue with you saying it's had trouble getting traction. I, I look at 3D the same way that um, HD, high definition, was in the beginning. I mean, you know, for, for years, I mean, you know, it was, it was a niche thing, you know, pe people couldn't afford it, they were expensive, and, you know, it seems that in, in a matter of, of just a couple years, you know, maybe two or three years, that, you know, like that took off, and, and now everyone's got an HD set. And, you know, it was the same, I think it'll be sort of the same thing with Blu-ray and um, same thing with 3D. It, it really, it, it, there has to be a tipping point that's reached, and, and once that happens, you know, people just, just rush to the technology. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily count out 3D yet. There's, there's a lot of money behind it. There's a lot of big name manufacturers, and um, it's, I don't think it's going anywhere. I think once these, these uh, corporations have, have put their minds and their you know wallets and their bank accounts behind something like this, you know they're they're gonna gonna make sure it gets adopted. Well, I I sort of agree. I think this the the glasses 3D TV thing is going to die out. Yeah, it, that's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. And then you know a bunch of time's gonna go by. Three years, four years, we're gonna have glasses free 3D TV that's actually gonna be good. Uh, and then people will be willing to pay for it because they remember back 10 years ago to when they coughed up lots of dough for the HD set and now they can eat more easily justify another big purchase. Because right now, you know, these people that are sort of looking at 3D TVs probably got a HD TV just a few years ago. So they're already spent from, from that. So, so I think your next question is probably going to be, you know, what are the 3D applications on a smartphone? And and I think 3D on a smartphone um, hinges a lot upon the success of um, 3D in the um, in the living room. So I'm not sure then that 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 smartphones are ready for 3D. You know, I, I'm just not sure that there's enough content there to, to justify it. it. It seems to me gimmicky at this point. Interesting. So you think that 3D on the smartphone will work when there's enough. 3D content. In other words, you think that 3D on the smartphone will be for viewing movies and TV shows that are in 3D. Right, and, and also playing games, but and you know, it's, it's another chicken or egg thing. The, the screens have to be out there for them to make the content, but, but people aren't necessarily interested in making the content until there are enough screens out there. Right. So we'll see, but um, you know, right now it, it's just, you know, they're only even doing like the, the first um, dedicated um, 3D gaming system with the Nintendo 3DS, and you know you have a smattering of these sharp um, 3D handsets, but but right now it's really a um, sort of a, a boutique thing, and you know, I I don't really think that that the average person's going to get much out of out of buying this first round of you know the the LG Optimus 3D unless unless LG can push you know a ton of their own. Um, you know, content that they that they um, pay for and commission and whatever. Yeah, that's. I think that's the key. I mean, if LG has developed some revolutionary 3D interface for your home screens or some new email experience that utilizes the X Y Z axis, which would be confusing because you can't interact with the Z axis. Sure. Um, it's only you know, it's real only for like display purposes. Right. So. We'll see. I feel like, in kind of a sense, LG is kind of rushing this product out to be the first. Yeah, and hey, would it be the first time that they did that? You know, they're they're big on um, you know having the first dual core smartphone. You know, having the brightest. Everyone wants to to be able to hang their hat on something. It's all about the marketing material. Well, we will, uh, we're will. we sending Tony to Mobile World Congress, so hopefully he will provide some hands-on time. We don't have a 3D camera, and YouTube doesn't do 3D yet, so... And monitors can't do 3D, so it'll be... Oh, he's Anton, by the way, to our readers who just uh, read bylines. Yeah, yeah, Anton Dinaghi, we call him Tony, because that's what he prefers to be called. But he will be in Barcelona in the next couple of weeks for uh, Mobile World Congress. So we'll see all this stuff. We'll be talking a lot about it. Um, should be interesting. Let us move on. Something we posted on January 26th, 2 million Windows Phone 7s shipped so far. So my, mm -hmm. qu my question here is, 
Is this a sign of success or not for Windows Phone 7? I don't know. I think, uh, I mean, I, you know, I obviously do a, a lot of reading about this stuff and see a lot of numbers and, and everything's conflicting, but I'd say overall the, the feeling I'm getting is that Windows Phone 7 is doing, is doing okay as expected to a little bit better than expected. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The more I think about Windows Phone 7, sort of in the confines of the other operating systems that are sort of advancing, the more I think about it as a platform that isn't meant to compete with Android. Uh, these, these updates are coming out slow. Um, there's still a lot I can't do on Windows Phone 7. I mean, the interface is gorgeous. Using it is, is, a, is a pleasure. But going from Windows Phone 7 to an Android phone, I just feel like my handcuffs are coming off and I can, you know, flap my wings in the breeze and do a lot more. Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, it's definitely a first-generation product. And, you know, I, it's fun to play with, but I, I certainly would not spend my own money on one of the handsets and, until... You know, they at least get this first round of updates, if not, you know, the, the second round that's supposedly coming later in the year as well. Is that Mango? Uh, yeah, exactly, Mango. And, and something else I'm kind of disappointed about is the, the developer support. I mean, obviously the platform is locked down enough to where the most we can do right now with Chevron WP7 is change ringtones, change um, maybe some theme colors. But there's, I mean... I was hoping by now we could, you know, completely change the interface and remove rich restrictions and have a third-party way of uh, multitasking through applications, a simple fast app switcher. But so far, that doesn't seem to, to be the case. And I know the develop, development yeah. community is working on this, but it's taking a while. Yeah, the security is tight on this operating system, really, really tight. You know, the probably the tightest ever on, on something mobile. Yep. And... Um, yeah, they they worked hard to make sure that um, that 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 there's you know a number of, of different um, of, of restrictions up that that are keeping um, hackers from from totally opening it up. And, and as we've learned, it it may never be totally open. Um, and, and even if it is, you're you're probably committing a crime if you um, if you use a lot of these services that you didn't pay for. Yeah. Like Xbox Live and um, you know anything where you're connected to a Microsoft server, um, the, the the only way you're supposed to have access to that is if you pay uh, for for your handset and, and implicitly for a license to use that copy of Windows Phone Seven. Yep, yep. I uh, on on the on the bright side to this, HD two owners have been able to finally run Windows Phone Seven on their device. I don't know if you remember Evan, but you know, when Windows Phone 7 came out, there was almost daily rumors of whether the HD2 could run Windows Phone 7. One day it was yes, one day it was no. One day it was, and it just kept going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And finally, through through sort of unofficial, um, unofficial means, we can run Windows Phone 7 on the HD2, and it works very, very well. Of course, you can't run, you know, Xbox Live and all the other services connected to the cloud, but... Yeah, if you want to push it a little bit. Think about it, though. What, at least as compared to um, the previous OS, what are you really losing other than marketplace access? And, and that was even only there for, for very late in uh, Windows Mobile's um, you know, lifespan. I mean, that's, I think that's the biggest thing. And I, I think a lot of people will look at Windows Phone 7 with the stock applications not being able to load Twitter and Facebook and say, this is this is ridiculous. Yeah, but, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And I'm sure that those applications will, will become available through sideloading. And, and, you know, they'll they'll have an entire catalog just like they do with with, um, with, with iTunes apps. You know, they've, they've cracked those. And if, you know, you're into piracy, you can get those all for free and sideload them. And, you know, it, it, it's, all, it's all possible if you want to do stuff like that. So... Well, hopefully, though, there will be a legitimate way to access the marketplace with a, I guess, unsanctioned copy of Windows Phone 7, and everyone will be happy. Yes. <laughs> uh, just one final note on this piece of news about 2 million Windows Phone 7s shipped. Sort of an unfair comparison, but was doing some research. Uh, Windows Phone 7 has been out for about six months now. 
And the iPhone was around for about eight months before it sold two million uh, units. But of course, that's kind of unfair because not only are we three and a half years later when smartphones are becoming more ubiquitous, but Windows Phone 7 launched with nine or ten devices, whereas there was only one iPhone and one carrier, so it's hard. hard I think all, this, all that says is how well the iPhone. It doesn't say anything at all about, about Windows Phone 7, but it does say that, that the iPhone was an incredibly successful product. That's, that's fair. That's fair. Cool. All right, so let's move on to January 26th, where we were talking about the Galaxy S2. Dos. How do you say two in French? Do. Do. Yeah, but it's, uh, if you're, the Mobile World Congress will be in Spain, so I think dos was probably more appropriate. <laughs> Fair. So, Mobile World Congress, the Galaxy S2. The Galaxy S was a very, very important series of devices for Samsung. You know, they were able to strike up uh, partnerships with every carrier in the U.S., and we saw it also in other versions abroad. And, you know, that, that relationship led them to get the Galaxy Tab on every carrier. And now Samsung potentially rivals uh, the, the brand notoriety that HTC had in, you know, 2009. Yeah, well, I mean, when you think about it in the bigger picture, I mean, Samsung has always been a bigger company in general than HTC, and... You know, HTC sort of came in and ate their lunch for a little while, but you know, Samsung has had these these deep carrier relationships in place for years, long before you know HTC was a glimmer in anyone's eye. So I so it was uh, potentially a giant, in other words. What's that? Samsung was sort of a sleeping giant for for a few years, at least in the smartphone space. Yeah, that's that's true. They had the inroads. They had the 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 bigger brand, the bigger company, and they. You know, they spent some good time on the Galaxy S. The Galaxy S was a uh, great device. You reviewed the Fascinate, right? Right. And what did you think of it? Mm. Excuse me. You caught me in the middle of a swallow. Um, I, I liked it overall. It's, it's a good device. Um, you know, it, it's very similar to, I think, a lot of the, the other high-end Android handsets out there. Um, one thing I didn't like so much on it, and, and which probably would keep it from being a DLA driver for me, is that it didn't have a, a dedicated camera shutter button and um, uh, versus, say, a, a, the Droid X, which does have that button. Um, and, and also, I, I like the, the form factor a little bit more of the, the X, even though um, the Fascinate is, is you know, slimmer and sleeker. I, I sort of think there's something cool about the boxiness of the X, and the same thing with the, the iPhone 4. And, and from the rumors we hear, the, the Galaxy S2 is also going to be a little bit boxier, at least at those, you know, those, those leaked, supposed leaked um, renders or, or photos or, or whatever or turn out to be, um, you know, accurate. Yeah, that seems to be the trend. We had the, uh, the sort of Nexus 1 looking devices and many, many, many devices that look like that with the rounded edges. Now we're starting to see some squared off edges like on the Droid X and the you know, even the Dell Venue and the very boxy shape of the, the iPhone 4. I uh, just want to go back to something you said about the dedicated camera key. I think one of the smartest things Microsoft is requiring for Windows Phone 7 is the dedicated camera key. And that feature where you tap and hold the camera key when the phone is off and boom, you're in the camera app. I can't stand using an on-screen uh, camera button. It's It's so annoying. And it must cost these companies, you know, very small amounts of money to include a shutter button in the design yeah. of their device. I don't think it's a, it's definitely not a matter of cost. That you no, know, I think for some of these companies, at least Apple, you know, they they want to they want to have as few buttons as possible. I mean, I'm sure that they would love to to get rid of the volume buttons and, and the power button too if they could. But you know, some things you, you just have to have. And um, yeah, it, it, it's definitely just a design decision. I feel the same thing with Samsung on, on the Galaxies. You know, they wanted, they sort of wanted to ape the iPhone a little bit to, and to one-up it. And, and what did Adam say in his review? He said that the, uh, I think it was the Vibrant, he said it, it came the closest to, uh, to any phone uh, into, you know, to being an iPhone, you know, killer or a beater or whatever you call it. So, yeah. Um, I, uh, I I agree with you on that. I, I definitely like to have it, and, and that's that's one of those um, cases where 
where where function definitely takes uh, precedence over over form, over form. At least for me. You know, I I th I think that the uh, dedicated camera button is going to go to the way of the three point five millimeter headphone jack. I think back a few years ago, OEMs had the same opinion of the three point five millimeter headphone jack, especially HTC that why would they add a stupid hole to the phone when they could just do everything through the charging and syncing port? But, you know, I, I think in a year from now or two years from now, it's going to become commonplace across the board for there to be uh, a dedicated camera button. And I'm sure you're going to disagree with that. No, I agree with you, actually. And um, uh, I think it's I think also with the, getting rid of the headphone jack, part of the thinking there was that that Bluetooth was taking off and that there was no reason for it because everyone was buying these Bluetooth headphones. <laughs> but that, that it turned out to, to grow only to a certain point. You know, everyone's phone has A2DP in it now, but you really don't see a lot of Bluetooth headphones out there still. Yep. Um, because the battery life is so short, they're not really comfortable, you know. There, there's a lot of reasons that, that they haven't taken off. Yep. But, um, it looked like they might, and you know, at least, um, you know, as far as headsets go, I mean, those, those were getting really big too. So, yeah, I, I can see how how the thinking was. You know, why why do we need this this extra port here when, you know, we can we can sort of gently push people towards going wireless. Right. Right. Good point. I uh, <laughs> I I remember back maybe four or five years ago when Bluetooth headsets were going to be the rage, and I was thinking about launching a Bluetooth headset website, and uh, <laughs> there's, uh, no, there's actually, there is actually a Bluetooth headset website out there. Um, uh, Michael Orr of Mobile Burn, one of my friends uh, in the community here, launched a site. It was pretty cool. He reviewed Bluetooth headsets, news on Bluetooth headset, but uh, I think sort of with the, with the trend of people just using the phone as a phone and without a Bluetooth headset, he kind of uh, stopped, you know, going with that site but yeah, I mean I think you could get decent SEO on a, on a site like that you know if you worked at it yeah. there's gotta be a lot of searches or enough searches for, for Bluetooth stuff that you you know you could you could keep it going but I don't think you could you know you could grow it into anything really big yeah very very niche idea exactly very cool alright so we've got two more stories to cover I think this uh, this this pocket cast is gonna run a little bit longer than we had anticipated but that's okay Hopefully. Uh, one thing, can I, I don't know, if, uh, before we move on from the Galaxy S2, I wanted to mention to you, I don't know if I told you that um, that Gabe and I were looking through the, um, one, uh, an early version of the firmware had actually leaked out, um, and, and this was um, this was way before we knew that um, the i9200 was the Galaxy S2. Uh -huh. um, for a long, long time, we thought um, the i9100 right. was, was what it was going to be, so... You know, that's why everyone's waiting for that firmware and they're looking for those pictures on Picasa and, and it just never hit it because everyone was looking for the wrong thing. So but once we realized this, we, we took apart the uh, firmware and um, uh, it's going to be sort of a letdown to people that um, that all of the uh, wallpapers in there are um, WBGA resolution. Uh. So I don't know if, if, if that's necessarily just a placeholder and, and since it was an early version of of the ROM, maybe you know, maybe they use a different screen on early versions of the phone. But I, th I think that's highly suggestive that um, we're not going to be seeing um, we're not going to be seeing you know an Atrix uh, style screen in there. That would be despicable if in 2011 Samsung's flagship is not up to par with Motorola's flagship. Maybe 2011 will be the year of Motorola. Although you could argue that 2010 was. But well, that's disappointing. I am going to be uh, very upset for the rest of the day. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to ruin your day like that. <laughs> Hopefully, it's a placeholder. They really need to bump the resolution. Um, you know, especially if they're going to do a larger than 4.0 inch screen. It's nice to have some extra pixels there. The good news is that is that uh, camera must definitely be 8 megapixels because um, there was there were some icons in there for um, for an 8 megapixel camera. I much rather have a three megapixel camera that takes awesome pictures than a 25 megapixel camera that has lots of noise when you put them on your computer monitor. Oh, really? You weren't, you weren't happy with the, uh, the Galaxy S and the Fascinate? Uh, no. The, S, the, um, the Nexus S? I think the Nexus S has a better camera than the 
Galaxy S devices, although I have to look back at that. I'll tell you what, the real improvement that Galaxy S owners are going to be looking for is uh, in the GPS. Oh, of course. That, that's a notorious problem and possibly a, you know, you know, a, a hardware problem, a, a defect with uh, you know, a phone that sold you know, millions. We're going to see a Toyota-style recall soon. That'd be funny. That would be. All right, so let's move on. On January 27th, we were talking about a BlackBerry leak, or several BlackBerry leaks. The Curve Touch, among others. Mm-hmm. Let's see. So which, which devices are in question here? The Monaco Touch, the Curve Touch. The Monaco Touch is the... Oh, and then there is the Bold Touch. So I think we're talking about three devices here. There have been quite a few devices that have been leaked um, in the past couple of weeks. I think it's a total of, of four to five. Four. I guess. I think, I think we're looking at four here. It might even be five. I know we're looking at um, the, the Dakota, which it's like a, a bulb, but with a touch screen. Right. And then there was the, um, the Storm 3 that, that was shown off, the Torch 2. And then we have both the, um, the, the next generation curve, which is the Sedona, or the Apollo. Or I think it's the Sedona, though. And then there's also the touch curve. So that would be five handsets, right? It's a lot. Yep. So, yeah, lots going on in the BlackBerry world. But, and, and from the specs we saw, some of these are, are, are looking like they're, they're finally catching up. But... You know, for, for many years, BlackBerry has been, you know, totally behind the times in screen resolution, processor speeds, storage space, camera resolution. I mean, you know, you name it, you name the category, and, and Room has been, you know, behind the times. But it looks like they're, they're finally starting to catch up with this latest generation. Yeah, the, the Monaco Touch has a 1.2 gigahertz processor. Do, do any of these have uh, dual-core chips? I'm not sure, but I mean, their BlackBerry is just—they're just lucky to sort of get their their stuff together right now. Yeah. You know, they're they're overhauling their operating systems. You know, there's they're probably going to be moving everything over to a, a QNX based um, system away from you know the current um, BlackBerry OS architecture. So I think they're and and I think um, he, they they've even been quoted as saying you know they're. They're they're not ready to put these uh, these dual core processors in the phones until um, you know they're 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 able to um, you know meet a certain level of power consumption or whatever for you know because it's still you know a lot of these are primarily business machines and you know business people on road trips whatever they want you know they want to get a certain amount of battery life out of their phone right I I think the uh, the the key is the transition to to QNX and dual-core processors. I think the, the devices we're talking about right now are sort of bridge devices that don't really bring that much new stuff to the table. The, the specs are bumped a little bit, um, but we're probably going to see some big-time smartphone BlackBerry magic, you know, uh, this time next year with probably a rethought BlackBerry operating system um, running on some pretty beefy uh, hardware. Absolutely, I would. Uh, Very good. And speaking of next generation software, let's talk about Honeycomb. On uh, let's talk about Honeycomb. Yes, the delicious Honeycomb. On January twenty seventh, we took a uh, we took some time to take a look at the Honeycomb emulator, trying to get a sense for how Honeycomb will work on smartphones because we are very very curious, and we know that Honeycomb is coming to smartphones, but we don't know how. And we've seen hints of it. Um, we, you know, if you resize the emulator, strangely, you get an interface that looks like gingerbread, but a little bit different. Um, which kind of was contrary to my thinking, which was that uh, Honeycomb for smartphones is going to have a lot of the UI of Honeycomb for tablets. But you know, February second is just around the corner. We're gonna probably be learning a lot about Honeycomb. For smartphones, and I, I, I think that resizing the Honeycomb emulator and seeing the gingerbread interface 
it was just kind of Google's way of saying that, hey, we're working on it, and this isn't complete or even close to complete, because it was completely inoperable. It wasn't, it, I, I kept getting a forced close on the launcher. What do you, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Honeycomb for the smartphone? What do you think it's gonna, gonna look like? You know, honestly, I just, I just don't know enough yet to say. I don't think Google is really revealed enough. You know, I, I think in general, you have to assume that, that they're gonna keep the same basic styling cues. So, so in the one sense, I think that, you know, the, that it could tell us a lot about what it's gonna be like. But, but on the other hand, you know, it's, it's a totally different screen size, different applications, different usage scenarios. So I, I'm not sure that, that it could tell us all that much, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I guess. I, I've been on this Android kick lately. Um, Lately, for the past three years, you mean? No, 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 no. I was, I was on an iPhone kick. I was then I was on a Windows Phone Seven kick. Now I'm on a, an Android kick. Um, and you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about this. And the tablet has a few paradigms. I guess we can call it that. That is completely different than how Android functions today. For example, the buttonless design. So all of the buttons are virtual. They're on the bottom of the screen. You get the home button and the back button. I really think that that's coming to the smartphone to allow for buttonless hardware, and then this. Not, the, and it's like the worst idea ever. I'm, I'm so what, unhappy with that trend. There's, of buttonless. That needs to be buttons for stuff. You know. Uh, I used to love those Windows Mobile phones that had about a trillion buttons. Oh man. Each of them like three, um, you know, three different functions. There's. So, there was like a, a button for calendar, for contacts, for web, for phone, for I mean, it just it was ridiculous. Yeah, it was great. You know, you had your multitasking button, and then, you know, you had the, um, what was that thing, the, the scroll wheel, the thumb wheel. Sometimes they were, like, multi-directional thumb wheels, like on the, <laughs> remember the Clie? Oh, the yeah. Clie back in the day. Oh, man. Um, but yeah, I like buttons. I like the, all the buttons on the trio, how you could, you know, assign the, the S key to launch an application or the R key. So, so I'm a big fan of buttons, and, and I... I don't like the fact that, that we're going to have phones with, with no buttons at all because, you know, sometimes your screen freezes up and, you know, the UI goes and, you know, wonky and then you need to use a button for something that's not there. I guess. I, I, I tend to, to be on the opposite side of the camp. I think that um, ha when OEMs don't need to place buttons on phones anymore, we're going to see these very futuristic-looking screens and the screen will actually be the phone, uh, but there will be a razor thin bezel all the way around the screen. Um, the the screen size will be maximized, and uh, I, I think There's nothing from stopping them to doing that right now. I mean, you know, you could, um, you know, you you could make uh, an Android phone like. I mean, if it were technically possible to get the screen that close to to the edge of the phone, it it would have been done already. I don't think it's the buttons that are holding things up. You know, you could you could put the buttons on the on the bottom of the phone, for instance, if you wanted uh, a full screen phone like that, and, and to still keep the you know the requirements of the, the OS. Yeah, you know, buttons require a minimum height to be pressable. So I, I agree with you that the technology should already exist for bezels to be really thin. And and I mean, if you look at the HD two, that has a extremely thin bezels on the right and left side, but then on the top it's a little bit thick, obviously, for the proximity sensor, the speaker grill, and the bottom is like 150% times bigger than the top bezel because you need those buttons, you need the logo, and I'm, I'm just saying with no buttons, then we get to bump the screen down that would usually be taken up by those hardware keys. Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. I still, you know, I, I like some buttons on the sides of the phone, though, for, for different things. Uh, I'll I'll uh, I'll compromise with you though. You you can take all the buttons off the face if you if you lose them on the sides. Um. Okay, I'll go with that. Add, sure. okay. Just on our, our next dream phone. On the next pocket now dream phone. Although don't put a uh, pressure or what was it on the continuum, the pressure the squeeze sensor. Uh, it just it didn't work. I mean the concept's great. You pick up your phone, you squeeze it a little bit, it turns on, but it it wasn't calibrated properly or. Just didn't work right. What is this? The continuum has this. Yeah, the one with the the Android with the ticker on the bottom. The, with the fake ticker, where it's really just one big LCD that they they blacked out part of it. Yeah, that's the that's the one. 
Um, so real quick, just want to continue a couple of thoughts on Honeycomb for smartphones. So I think that that's the first interface paradigm that's going to come forward from the tablet is the virtual buttons. We're also going to finally, finally see a better way to multitask in Android. Android has been multitasking since day one with a press and hold of the home button, which takes too long. It's, a, it's about a second or two delay. Um, I know that seems ridiculous, but compared... You're still young. See, that's the thing is you get older. It's, it, you don't care so much about, um, about the time, and you're not in such a hurry. I, I think I'll always be in a rush, Evan. It's just there's too much to do. So, so you know, with Android 3.0 and Honeycomb, you press this button, that it's to the right of the home button, you get a little pop-up preview of the screens that are open. And you can access that from any program. So instead of a tap and a, and a hold to see the recent programs, it's just a tap and you get the previews. Very simple concept, although I think even better would be the upcoming, perhaps, iOS 4.3 for iPhone multitasking feature where you use four fingers and you can swipe right to left. I mean, that is awesome to be able to multitask that way. Um, yeah, it's, it's complicated, though. So many gestures you have to remember and whatnot. <laughs> really? I mean, that's pretty simple to remember. Well, I, it's just the beginning, though. You know, I mean, you look at the... I don't know, do you have a, a, a MacBook or, you know, one of these these, these Mac, um, these Apple pads, the, the touch pads? Yeah, there's quite a few, you know, multi-finger gestures. It's, it's like a whole uh, whole dictionary of new uh, moves that you have to learn. Yeah, you're right. I agree. And I think the same thing every time I sit down in front of a Mac. But the truth is that when you're spending that much on a new piece of technology, you're more than willing to learn five, ten gestures. And I think the same will be the case for, for a smartphone. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if the, the functionality is there, you're going to want to try to take advantage of it. Totally. Uh, and one final thing that I think, or I hope, is coming to Honeycomb for smartphones is a new way to organize the home screens. Because right now on Android, if you have a full, a full home screen and you want to switch the location of two icons, you have to like delete one or slide it off the screen and then you move the other one in its place and then add the other one. You, you, can't, do, you can't move two things at once. And it's hard for you to manage, you know, seven, six, five home screens. In Honeycomb, on tablets at least, you get this awesome looking zoomed out view of your home screens with sort of like a tray that shows you all your apps, all your widgets. And uh, I don't know how they would do that on a smaller screen, but I really hope that, that it comes through on the smartphone version of Honeycomb. Yeah, I agree. Home screen management is tough, especially as, you know, you have, you have all these like different sized widgets and... You know, you're trying to get everything to work in both portrait and landscape. It's totally a mess. And, you know, you have some of these uh, these OEMs that just won't even let you do landscape now. You know, you turn the, if you're on your home screen, you turn your phone sideways, just, you know, nothing rotates. Yeah. Although I got to say, uh, I use Launcher Pro, which has that feature. You can do landscape home screens. I always turn it off because... For some reason, this, the device has a hard time in rearranging the home screen into landscape, and it takes like two seconds. And I guess because I'm young, I, I don't like to wait, but... Um, well, that, exactly, that's what I'm saying. It's like they can't <laughs> get it right. You know, it's like this huge, this huge problem, this general problem with smartphones, you know, not specific to any manufacturer. But, you know, also with the, when you say rearranging um, home screens, one of, one of the worst, in my opinion, is Windows Phone 7. That, that, it, that's just an exercise in frustration, trying to get it to look how you want and trying to you know, switch things around. It's just nothing behaves logically, at least in, you know, for me. I don't know if you, if you had a different experience with it. Well, in Windows Phone 7, uh, you know, I, I set my home screen and I didn't do anything else with it for you know, several weeks on end. I, I think that because the home screen setup is so simple, I mean, you get either two by one blocks or one by one blocks. You don't really have that need to move stuff around. Whereas in Android, I mean, you you can download new widgets and new programs, and you want to make your home screens look awesome, and you're always moving stuff around. So, I agree, it's a little, it's also challenging in Windows Phone Seven. But I didn't find myself with that frustration because I wasn't moving stuff around so often. All right, so that concludes the first episode of the Pocket Cast. Again, it's a little bit different 
in terms of the formatting than other podcasts that are out there. For one, we're doing this over YouTube. Of course, we're very open to the idea of putting this on iTunes and the Zune Marketplace and lots of other places. But we wanted to start off this way and kind of give you a conversation about what happened this week in smartphones because we're fascinated by this stuff and hopefully you are all too. Uh, so again, leave us as much feedback as you can. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Do you like this? Do you hate it? We have a thick skin. We just want to know if we should continue doing this. So thank you, Evan, for being the first guest of the Pocket Cast. Thanks for having me, brother. And uh, we will uh, see you guys on the site next week. Have a good weekend.